Welcome to the Social Desert Number 57. Podcast number 57. 72. <laughs> Yay. 72. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I often wonder why we continue doing this with Dave. I, <laughs> Can we please do the informal poll now? Okay, guys, how many of you would love to never have Bruce Wayne. Wait, 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 wait. Again. You already did the, the poll the yesterday podcast. in the full room. This is a new group. It's a new you group. You just keep doing the poll over and over and over How many again? of you would like to not have Bruce Hornsby on the podcast? Listen. listen. Raise your, yes, you see? What? Thank you. Thank you. I love you guys. I think I voted twice, and, even. and how many of you oh, want twice? Bruce Hornsby on the podcast? Yeah, yeah see, we got... Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 there's like four people. No, no, They're just no. making a lot of noise. The public, the public has spoken. <laughs> this is. I think this is actually the first time... Out of all the things we've ever done that you've won, I'm pretty sure you paid these people off before I got here. I did not. I, there may no. There may have been some no. Nothing. But they just are smart, intelligent people. They're at a hacker conference. Just because, just because you don't have any sophistication for the piano. Oh, Chris, sophist- um, no, no. I'm sure if we played good piano music, all these people would be like, "Yeah, keep it on the podcast." We should right? get Bruce Hornsby on the right? podcast. You like, you like pianos, We've right? We've asked Bruce Hornsby to be on the podcast. Yeah. We asked Bruce Hornsby to come on the podcast. He has never responded. He's never responded. But guess who came in all the way from the UK for the podcast? Bruce Hornsby. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is... <laughs> wow. Not only does he hate Bruce Hornsby, but you just called him Bruce Hornsby. And he deserves it for all the stuff he's been putting me through this morning. What? He, you're, you're We're not, kind of enemies now. Wait, just... wait, you, are, you, are, you are badgering the guest. Oh, there's a lot more to come. I mean, actually, he could probably destroy me in a uh, conversation, so I'm probably going to just start to... Hey, I like you. <laughs> no, 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 don't, don't. Uh, oh, this is... I, I, I'm being hugged by a man I just met. <laughs> oh, I don't know what we're doing here. And he's dressed as Batman. Yes. Just pretty easy. Anyway, I was trying to introduce our guest, Paul Wilson. So welcome, Paul, everybody. Who has been on the podcast many times. He's been on the podcast before. He wrote the forward for my first book. He's um, uh, originally from the TV show The Real Hustle, the the real one, not the one that we tried to remake here in the States. (laughs) Um, You just had a documentary that came out, right? Yep. All about your work. Yeah. And and you have a pretty popular show also. Yeah, we did. It was a couple years ago, but we did. So... um, we're going to take questions for him in a minute, but I know everyone was asking about the, uh, the events here. So, um, do we want to tell people what happened? Or? Why would we not tell people what <laughs> happened? Now? And you're like whispering like no one can hear you in the audience right now. That's, <laughs> do, we, do we not want to tell people what happened? Michelle, 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 do I, do I want to tell people? Number 37. Uh, so, <laughs> so, our winner uh, for the CTF was uh, Jen Fox. How many people saw her call? Yeah, right. she was awesome, huh? She, she smashed awesome. the target. Yeah. Smashed them. So there's a problem, uh, men in the audience. This is the third year women have won in a row. So next year I'm going to only have one woman in the, um, in the, in the, in the competition, so well, we may have a chance. a man was number two, if that makes you feel better. That hurts, Michelle. Men. That hurts. Aren't we and, always really just number two? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, basically it's like that representative marriage? of life. <laughs> Representative of life. Wait, my wife listens to this podcast. Uh, can, we, can we blurt that out, please? No, no, that's, a, that's going to be probably the new theme music. <laughs> Isn't that marriage, Dave, by Dave Kennedy? That's going to be on our shirts next year. Right, um, right. Uh, and John Serpa was the second place winner for this, so pretty awesome, huh? And in all fairness, he too smashed. So, he, yeah, he yeah. did. Actually, <clears throat> there, the previous years, you know, we had like huge gaps in the scores. Uh, this year we didn't have huge gaps. Um, I, I believe uh, Jen was at like 1,037, and John was at like 1,014. Wow! So close it was ball. yeah, it was really it was close. close, really really close game this year. So um, that it was interesting. The next guy below them was at 988 or something like that. So there there wasn't these huge gaps like in previous years where you saw the winner and the second place being up in the thousands, and then the next person at like 500. That wasn't the case this year. It was like everybody was pretty evenly spaced, except for those who didn't show at all. They, they didn't. And, and for, for those of you who are asking, we will try to get those scores on the website soon. Yeah, yeah, soon. we will. Soon being sometime between now and next DEF CON. Yeah, that's soon. Yeah, that, that's soon for us. That will be this week sometime. We will do it because it's not that difficult to do it. We'll get it up there. And uh, we are going to be working on the report from here on out. 
And by we, I mean Michelle. So, um, you know, that's the we in this. Chris, um, I have to say something real quick here. I'm, I'm impressed by you right now because this is the first year that I think I've known you since DEF CON that you haven't lost your voice. I know. That's crazy, isn't that's it? True. Yeah. Have you guys been to the podcast before? And so Chris is always like, th th this data in the podcast, I mean, I, I, this is my first podcast that I've ever made it at DEF CON, but first of all. But yeah. uh, whenever I listen to the podcast afterwards, it's like, yeah, welcome to the Social Engineer Podcast. Yeah, normally I sound like the godfather. I'm like, so... Let me tell you about social engineering. Congratulations. Thank you, you. You must be getting uh, acclimated in your old um, age, as um, I proved yesterday how old you were. No. Uh, <laughs> so, Dave. Forty-something. You know, wow. But yes, I mean, yes uh, I'm 42. Yeah. I'm just saying you look good for your age. I wouldn't have thought you were 42. That's because yeah. I don't listen to Bruce Hornsby. <laughs> So I still have all my hair. Which I, I think you are going a little bald in the back. I just throw that out there. And I'm an expert in this, so. Uh, I don't know why we even have my show. Oh, okay, and yesterday we had the kids thing. The kids uh, CTF. You guys uh, see all the little kids running around? We did something. Well, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it's pretty cool because it wasn't my idea. But I think it was pretty cool. Um, we had the kids draw. They had, one of the challenges they had to do was they had teams. And one kid had to draw pictures while the other kid described it. So the kid that was drawing was blindfolded. And, and then they had to draw what was on there and the person who, you know, they had to draw an image that the other kid was describing. Then all those images went to Eddie the Yeti and he um, put his art on them and then we auctioned them off for HFC. It's awesome. So yeah, so it was really cool. So um, we're gonna, we're going to get those pictures up. Tamara has them. She's going to send them to me, and we're going to put them on the website so you can see what they did. And it was really popular. And, then of course, you know, the parents were all proud, and they went, and we raised some money. I don't know yet how much uh, for, for HFC, so we're pretty happy with that. It was a pretty neat event. First time we tied in all those, all those different elements um, that was, this, was this year, so it was pretty cool. It's awesome. And then uh, Thursday event um, went off really well, like so well that we got asked to do it again next year and we very well may be teaming up with another village to make the event even bigger and better. So there, there may be a rumor being spread that we will be teaming up with Deviant and, and making a, a room, a length challenge that will involve physical and social engineering. So, um, and we may be spreading a rumor that that got approved by DEF CON and then we'll be planning that starting next month, you know. After, after Derby. Or next June. Yeah, or, or next, no, no. Whichever comes first. No, whichever comes yeah. first. Well, next month then. So, um, so we're really excited about that because that's, that's going to be, that, this year we didn't realize, we didn't know how it was going to take off. And uh, anyone here for that, the Thursday event? Yeah, a couple of you guys saw it. So, and the feedback that we got was really helpful. Like having the GoPro attached to the contestant was one suggestion we got, and we're working on how we can make that happen, and then doing some more interactivity, in, interaction for the audience. That was another suggestion we got, so we're working on some ideas for that, so it's a little easier for everyone to kind of sit through it. So that's the, uh, that's the SE Village this year. We had 10 speeches. Well, we had 10 planned. Our final speech on, th on Friday, she couldn't make it in the country because... Um, uh, she's from China, and the Chinese government wouldn't approve her visa. So we tried everything we could. We wrote a letter to her embassy saying that we would sponsor her to come in and that you know, we'd be responsible, and she, uh, she couldn't get it approved. So unfortunately, she couldn't come in for her speech. But we were really excited. We are hoping maybe we can get her in next year. She's the only, like, one of the only female SEs in China. So I thought, how cool would that be to have a talk from a female social engineer in China to see how that work is done there. So um, we'll see if we can get her, and if we can't, maybe we can get her on the podcast and talk about, about those things. So we'll keep you guys um, in touch for that. We had, yeah, we, thank you. We had some good speeches this year, too. Um, the rooms were packed, man. You guys were nuts. So they Seems gave like every the, year, yeah. like, y'all grow the space. It's, it's ridiculous, yeah. right? I mean, Jeff came in, and he's like, so we gave you 3,000 square feet, and now what do we do next year? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, can we have valleys? You know, just for the SE Village. And he just looked at me and walked away. But I did have a conversation last night with some folks from DEF CON because every, you guys did it again. I don't know if it's you in particular, but you've been complaining to DEF CON there wasn't enough space. So they asked, like, how can we expand it? 
you know, how can you, like, what room can you take over? So they're going to try to figure that out for next year. So I'm not sure if we'll be in a bigger space or in this space and how we're going to make it work, but I just want to say thank you to you guys because without you guys lining up to the elevator, uh, we would not have gotten that kind of a message from DEF CON. So that's, that's pretty cool. First year here and already packing the space out. So thank you for that, guys. Thanks. And, and thank you for having more people in the room for my speech than Dave's. I really appreciate that. Yeah, it was argumentable. A lot more people came in after my talk started, you know, because well, they didn't want to go saying, to yours. You know, I did the count, um, <laughs> and there was like one person more. Well, you always put me on late at night. I mean, yeah. it's like it's like oh, hey, seven o'clock when everyone wants to go out party on a gotta, Saturday. You got to win how you got to win. Okay, that's all there is to it. You know. How about how about you put me on at six o'clock next time and put you on at seven and see who wins? <sighs> Guys, I need your help, okay? Because you know. <laughs> Bring your, your families, your kids, your wives, your uncles, your I'm gonna cousins. Pay, I'm going to pay people off you're the gonna street. Pay, you're going to be outside. Five dollars to come. Hey, Colin will just run through the room and throw money on the floor. Okay. Now, yes, last night we, we, had, a, we had a little little gathering with some of our sponsors and people, and we had some things uh, that we gave out because, you know, this, this event and this room doesn't run just because of, of one person. Um, my team is pretty dang awesome, right? I mean, guys, seriously, like... Yeah, thank you, really. So, uh, four years ago, I used to, five years ago, I used to rent a, um, a storage space out here in Vegas, and I'd put all of the stuff in the storage space. And I'd come out here to Vegas, I'd rent a truck, I'd go to the storage space, load it on the truck, bring it to wherever we were, unload it, and then at the end of the podcast, run out, get the truck again, load it all, take it to the storage space, and then come back for the closing ceremonies, which in essence was like, you know, I wanted to hurt myself by the time I was done with that. And, um, and then the city of, of Las Vegas built a, a highway through my storage space. And I, I didn't know that you can do this, but when, you, when they build a highway through, you get a letter from the government saying, by the way, your storage space is about to be evacuated from everything. So you either come get it or you lose it and you have 30 days. Now I live on the East Coast. So that wasn't too easy, right? That wasn't like a, an easy thing. So um, we had a guy who lives out here, and he said, oh, you can, you know, you can put it in my house, you know, for a little bit until you figure out what to do. And I'm like, you don't understand. Like, this is a, sto it's a storage space full of stuff. Like, and, there, and then every year we keep expanding the village and doing more and more stuff. And then we order a billion things from the, everywhere on the Internet, and they all go to his house, and he stores them for weeks until we get here. And then he gets a friend who refuses to take any money and goes and picks it all up at his house and brings it here every year. And without, I mean, literally without that, uh, I don't know if we can do what we do because it would be way too much. Billy, where are you? Billy, come on over, man. I got something for you. <laughs> now, Billy doesn't drink, so I had these nice scotch bottles that were that were um, engraved. I, I was, I was going to give one to him, but I'm like, he doesn't drink, uh, which is really funny for a flair bartender in Las Vegas to not drink, right? That's a little weird, right? I mean, come on, it's a little weird. But um, so I figured, what can I get Billy that would be, that would just show our gratitude? So we got this little 3D like SE head engraved. You can look at it later in just a little. Billy, man, we love you, dude. Seriously. Seriously. Thank you. I mean, literally, you can see his house. His wife is, is like, got to be the nicest person on the planet Earth because she doesn't complain or kill us because the house is filled with our stuff. I mean, they had, like, it's, he took a picture of the boxes and what did you call it? Hacker Box Fortress or something? Hacker, it was like, it, it, it was taller than, it was just a whole room full of things. So, really awesome. So, um, that's the village. That's the village for this year. Next year, we'll try to keep it going. If you guys keep coming, then we'll keep having success. But um, I don't think we need to go through what, what's coming up next, right? No, I think we're good to move on to the guests. Okay, awesome. So, um, for those of you who weren't here during the introduction, we have our good buddy here, Paul Bruce Hornsby. Hornsby. No, he's not Bruce Hornsby. No. <laughs> Man, I'm kind of let down. Must be a fetish or something. Yeah, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly no, right. Assuming. So Paul Wilson <laughs> came in, as he stated before, all the way from the UK, just to come to our podcast. Thanks for coming. Yeah, I appreciate. Yeah. It. I, I, I'm yeah. all jesting aside. I appreciate you coming. Yeah, Finally thank you. Face so, welcome. 
So Paul's got a pretty diverse career, but uh, one of the things that I think is interesting from our perspective for social engineering is he's really good at like sleight of hand, illusion tricks. And you know, we, we're always fascinated by those kinds of things. I really stink at those things, but we're really fascinated uh, by people who can do all of that because it takes a lot of understanding how to misdirect people, right? Misdirection is a big thing. So we thought that'd be a good topic kind of for discussion. And uh, we have a mic set up over here. So what we want is, because it, we want all the questions, if you guys have some, on the podcast, and it's going to be really hard if you're yelling them out. So <clears throat> if any time during, if you have a question, just come up right here to the mic and ask a question, and then we can have an open discussion. But um, maybe a little bit, Paul, you can just tell a little bit about what you're, what you're doing now, what's going on with your shows and career and things like that. Right now I'm sitting in a podcast in Las Vegas, Talking about Bruce Hornsby, yeah. Yeah. which um, you know, as a career move, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it feels like things have gone bad. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, I, I spent uh, a long time producing a show called The Real Hustle, which uh, thank you. And then uh, we did a we did an American special called Scammed, which um, just uh, we didn't go to series with that, which is a shame. But uh, since then, mostly working in film, developing uh, my own film projects, directing and all that kind of stuff, and uh, just finished a film about con artists and um, getting into the, uh, the selling, distributing nightmare that every filmmaker has. And you had a book come out last year. Yeah, I did a book called The Art of the Con, which was for the public as a sort of primer for how and why you can be cheated and deceived in various ways. And uh, that's done really well. Um, you know, I got a nice quote from somebody at the table. Oh, oh, yeah, was oh. <laughs> you got that money, right? Yeah, 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 yeah I did. It was, okay. it was easier than reading it. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so I did the book, and, uh, and now occasionally we talk about doing other TV shows and other TV projects where we try and prove that uh, the stuff most people think is ridiculous, in other words, cons and scams and and various ways of taking money from people. Most people just think it's impossible, but I think we're going to maybe in the next year do a big American show where we uh, go after the public. We give them, unfortunately, we give them the money back. <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. How you but, get uh, money? Right? Yeah, I know, I know. But uh, we're going to go and do something here in the States. It's interesting that The Real Hustle is in 45 or 50 countries around the world. Oh. Never came to America. We had, the, we had the one sort of show that we did here. Apollo was part of it. And um, I know Apollo did great and Ryan did great. But uh, it just didn't catch. And it's a, it's a bit of a shame, really. Yes, yeah, it is. You know? It is. So maybe go, tell us an example of one of these cons that people don't Are you the one that sent me the Nigerian prince scheme? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've done that many times. I, I paid it. But he I, is I, a Nigerian I, prince yeah. for real, though. I am a Nigerian prince. And uh, I do need to put some money in an American bank account and there's anybody's interested so <laughs> far yeah, so, yeah one guy's nodding at the front yeah, but, yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. so I think uh, one of you know somebody made a comment yesterday about selling a bridge yeah. um, uh, we did that we sold the, the fourth rail bridge one of the most famous bridges <laughs> in the world and we asked ourselves a question we're gonna do some TV we've only got one day with the victim right we can't you know we can't uh, work on him for two months or anything so we decided to sell shares in the fourth rail bridge <laughs> and um, this guy gave us five grand for uh, a piece of the fourth rail bridge under the promise that wow. he would be paid a tiny amount for every uh, train that would go over it and in the course of three years he would get his money back and uh, you know even saying it now it sounds ridiculous but he was nodding all the way through and we got the money from him and from two other people who aren't on the TV show so it sounds ridiculous that you can sell a bridge but we yeah. figured it out you know we'll, we'll sell it in pieces you know and he got a lovely plaque as well it's beautiful it's brass plaque it, you know, said you own a piece of the bridge. It really says, I'm a sucker. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, we did that. I think the, the, there was lots of times when the, you, we would say, okay, we're going to do this scam, and the people at the BBC would say, well, this is ridiculous. This has never happened. And then we'd go and find... Mm -hmm. And one of them was um, we uh, were doing some pickpocketing, and street pickpocketing is completely different to theatrical pickpocketing, or you have to, you know, the skills in theatrical pickpocketing are way, way, way in advance of what the street guys do. So Apollo, I still think, is the, probably the number one theatrical pickpocket alive today and probably ever, yeah. I would say. That's amazing. So, you know, we're never going to be able to, you know, 
do that kind of thing. And on the street, you, you, you know, you're limited anyway. So I read about this pickpocketing technique people were doing, and I well, that makes perfect sense, and I submitted it. And in the meeting, they said, you're kidding, right? You're going to pick people's pocket with a pair of extendable barbecue tongs? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, because you don't have to get close. You just put your on, and it really works. And he said, this, is, this has never happened. It really works? It really works. And he said, this has never happened. I said, no, here's the, here's the article. The article was from Brazil, and this is exactly what they were doing. And they were putting tape. Remember the sticky bandits from Home Alone 2? Right, they were putting tape around the end so that you know, yeah. put their hand, they cannot fail but come out with a bunch of stuff. And then they put their jacket over it. So they were blown away and they said, this is, I can't believe this exists. What's next? Monk, trained monkeys? So I went on the internet and in about two minutes came up with articles explaining how people were training monkeys to go out and pick people's <laughs> That's <pants>. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody so, have any barbecue tongs by any chance? Yeah. Anybody? Yeah, if someone actually raised their hand, I would have been like, <laughs> yeah. okay, explain this is Def Con. I'm actually a little disappointed. Yeah. Wrapped, yeah. wrapped in yeah. sticky tape, anybody? Yeah, yeah. No. anyone have barbecue tongs? What are the chances? Tape? No one brought them with them. So you actually demonstrated this live, like on. Yeah, we did it. We, you know, we did. Do you have a monkey too? Um, I, I really wanted the monkey. That would have been awesome. I really wanted it. They wouldn't give me the monkey, unfortunately. Ah. Um, yeah. you got a monkey? Oh, we've got a monkey. We don't have barbecue have tongs, yeah, but we've got a monkey. Yeah, we don't have barbecue tongs, we got a monkey. Yeah, I hope you feed that thing. <laughs> So th there is this thing with cons and scams where it seems ridiculous when you explain yes. it to people that you do this, this, no, no one's ever going to fall for that. But there's a really funny thing that happens in cons and scams where the more ridiculous the scheme sounds when you're actually conning someone, when you've got them in your, in your power, that that kind of, well, this is so ridiculous, it must be true. This weird twisted logic comes up, and I really play that a lot. You know, where this, this scenario has come up and you can take advantage of it, but it has to happen now. And you see them kind of nodding. They ask questions, but in the back of their head, they're thinking, no one would make this up. And that's a really powerful thing. Yeah. You know? Why do you think that works so well? I think it works so well because people want what they want. And human nature is human nature. So yeah, people, you know, people will ask questions. They'll be really challenging. They'll try and verify. But in the back and buried in their little heads is this secret assistant to me, which is that desire for whatever it is you put on the table. And I always say the same thing, I've said it for years, if I know what you want, I can take everything you have. Because that's the seed I'm trying to grow, right? So you want it to be true, no matter how much you're challenging me, you want it to be true. And so really it's just a game of cat and mouse. And of course the worst thing I can do is just tell you everything I think you want to hear. So you put little stumbling blocks, you know, you make it, if it's too perfect, then it's like squeezing a pumpkin seed, right? It, it'll just jump away. So you've got to be really careful. It's like fishing. It really is like fishing. You know, if you pull too hard, you'll break the line. But if you play them right and let them, let them go a little bit, let them come back, eventually you can land them. And so there's that little, little assistant in your head. But the other, th you know, the other thing I talk about, and I think I only recognized it right in the book, was this thing that I call the con bubble, which is when you're in there, you know, I try and keep you in there. So all of your information is coming from me or from approved sources. So I can let you double check information if I supply you with the information or lead you to where the information comes yeah. from. But I can also set up little kind of um, stalling tactics. So I can tell you that people are going to tell you this is impossible because of this, because I just know what people are going to say. And, you know, the classic one, and unfortunately it's one of the cruelest ones, is Old people, if you ever watch the show, you notice we almost never went over anybody of a certain age. Because old people are, are, are constantly preyed on by con artists. So, one of the things so they say... Like old people like uh, Chris? Uh, people as old as Chris and maybe a little younger. I, yeah. I, I, I feel yeah. so old right now. <laughs> Thank you. But when you go after people of a certain age and you say something like, you know, your family won't want you to have this because they don't want you to make your own decisions anymore. Mm. That's something that old people are constantly faced when their children start to take over decisions for them, like who's paying the rent or where they're living. You know? And when they have access to money, it's easy to get access to that when you basically play to those aspects. And as a con artist, you would know that that exists in a large group of people. Yeah. And so you profile people that way. So you know, I always say, you know, I really genuinely despise most con artists. Mm -hmm. No, I say most because, you know, there's a certain level where, you know, I kind of really respect what people are doing because, you know, the, being a con artist doesn't mean you're stealing from people. There are other aspects to it. 
But yeah, genuinely, if you can figure out what people are going to say and what the motivation is for the, for the victim to resist the truth, you can play to that and you can almost sort of get people to put up your shield for you. So when they go out and they say, you know, I've got this business deal and it involves this guy from Nigeria. Oh, you know that's a scam. Yeah, they said you'd say that. You know, this, it's just really interesting. And it's all based on the same thing, that people want something. And it isn't just money. It's approbation and it's success and it's the ability to show that you've succeeded. That's one of the most powerful motivating factors, especially for the elderly. I know you think I don't know what I'm doing, but look what I just did. Right? And that's why they keep going after it. So even after it seems obvious it's a scam and they keep digging deeper, there's that weird little hope in the back of their head that says, no, 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 it'll be true. You just have to keep going. And, uh, and those guys go after that. And I'll take those guys down every day of the week, those, those con artists, because there's nothing lower. Yeah. You know? There's a story that... Um, stop me if I'm talking too much, but there's a story... I'll stop, I'll stop you. So anyways... Um, I'm not you. <laughs> 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 the, this is why we don't do live podcasts, by the way. <laughs> one of the, um, uh, I, met a, I met a woman called Marilyn Baldwin uh, on a TV show. And Marilyn had started a, a website called Think Jessica. And you can look it up. Jessica was her mother. And uh, when Jessica was older, she responded to junk mail, actual physical mail that was coming through the door. And she ended up on the sucker list. So sucker lists are, you know, as we know, the digital circle lists are now millions and millions of people. But when you ended up on a, on a, a mail circle list, you would start getting tons of stuff in. And the problem is that she started replying to all of it and getting into discussions and relationships with all these people who said they were psychics, um, who said they were bankers. And the problem was, was Jessica felt like she was isolated because her family were taking over decisions for her. But... As soon as they got a sniff of that and started talking to her about how she could make these decisions herself, she would isolate herself further from her family. And so by the time that she passed away and she was, she was, she was old, she had stopped talking really and the relationship with her daughter had gone. But when she passed away and they started going through all this mail, the things they had been saying to her were absolutely awful. And at one point she ran out of money and could no longer pay the psychic and I think she was based in Holland and Jessica was in, in England. And she said, uh, well, because you've stopped paying me, I can no longer protect you from evil, but I get a sense that there's an evil force living in the upstairs of your, your house. And that's why she had been living downstairs for the last year and hadn't gone upstairs. So when you see that, now that's an extreme, right? And you think, well, that would never happen to me. Well, I can figure it out. You, if I talk to you, if I figure out what you're really after, I can figure out where your level is, and I guarantee I can tailor a scam to anybody, and so can anybody else. And the first step is thinking that you're invulnerable. You know, if you don't think you can be conned, you are the first person I want to meet, you know? Well, Paul, this goes to my question regarding your work, and, and I was curious about whether or not there are specific people that you, you target for your marks, and if so, what, what kinds of things are you looking for? For television? Yes. Yeah. Um, for television, we're looking, we're, you know, that you, you don't really have much choice, let's be honest. You, you have to take what you can get in television, especially when the TV show's on the air. Mm. So, you know, you're just hoping someone doesn't recognize you. But there is, a, there is a filtering. First of all, we didn't go after people of a certain age group because we didn't want it to be dismissed. We wanted to prove we could go after certain groups of people. The other thing was we were on BBC Three, which is um, a, a channel kind of targeted at 18 to 24 year olds, but it's, it, it's expanded beyond that. So we wanted to get people of that age group as well. But then when we had a scam, if we were looking at the scam, obviously we wanted someone that this would appeal to before we started. We didn't want to, if we could avoid it, we didn't want to do a diamond deal with somebody who had no interest in something like that. So we would, um, we would try to get someone who had um, a previous interest in what it was we were trying to sell. But generally speaking, there wasn't this kind of feeling of we're just looking for people who are stupid because if they came across as stupid, again, it was easy to dismiss. And we, we did film a lot of people who were just obvious, they, you know, they'd buy anything from anybody. And that generally was not what we used because we would do every scam multiple times. The hardest thing was just maneuvering people because, you know, they can't know that they're coming to a TV show 
their friend who brought them knew everything and we were contacting them and they would try to maneuver them for whatever reason into the situation. But, but so much of the time they would turn up and they'd say, hey, um, you're that guy on TV. And that was the end. Uh, Is there or, any time that you didn't, I mean, like, were, that you weren't successful aside from them recognizing you? Oh yeah, there, there were, not as many as you would think, but there were definitely times it wasn't successful. And um, what stopped it? Like, what, what was it that the person did that stopped you as a you know, con artist? I'd like to say it was because they said, this is a scam, I'm getting out of here, but it wasn't. It was usually, you know, we got stopped a couple of times because we'd be talking to somebody, you would have secret cameras everywhere, and I'd be in the middle of the story, or Alex would be in the middle of the story, or Jess, and somebody would walk up and ask for an autograph. Uh. Which, when you're pretending to be a banker, it's not, doesn't really yeah. work. I get my bank's so, autograph all the time. You know? Um, <laughs> so, you know, something like that might happen. Uh, there might be that they just resisted, it just felt uncomfortable, but that wasn't as much as you would think. It was recognition most of the time. Mm -hmm. It was failure to arrive some of the time. But, you know, when it did go wrong, it, it would sometimes go wrong spectacularly. And the... My favorite, I think, my favorite of all the ones going wrong, and we did a special, we, we actually did a show where scams went wrong, and we showed you all That's the awesome. things, you know, it takes. <laughs> yeah, there were sometimes we thought it was going to be blown, but it wasn't, you know, we, you know, people would walk into a room and there'd be a, a guy, you know, under a table rigging cameras, and they'd just walk past them, you know, we'd ignore them, but we had a... Try and get this story right. What we were trying to we were trying to sell stamps or something, and we had it. We had tried to do this thing a couple of times, and I think it had gone wrong once for recognition. And it, in the later shows, we would always try and have a celebrity involved, somebody that they because you know we kept trying to change the, the the show. And now we've added another layer of recognition, so we would dress the guy up or the girl up, and uh, so this this scam had gone wrong once, and I can't remember why it went wrong. But the second time, we had this guy called Sido and. Um, very popular actor from EastEnders, a really nice guy. And uh, we put him in a wheelchair, we put him in a linen suit, and he was supposedly this collector who was going to buy something, and we dropped this guy in under some pretext. The scam I don't remember. But what I remember was the setup was this guy who had a business, and he was setting up his business partner, and has got his business partner to take money out of their joint bank account, cash, to take part in this deal that he sent him to. And so when he arrived, I was explaining the deal to him. Alex was involved. Alex was the seller, or I was the, the other buyer. And basically, me and Alex clearly didn't get on. This was the, this was the sell. And uh, we went into this meeting, and in the wheelchair is, um, is Sid. And I'm sitting there as this aggressive other buyer to try and get this guy to put the money on the table. And I, uh, I show this big envelope full of cash. And I put the, put the cash in the envelope, I switch it, it's now full of newspaper, and I put the cash on the table. And I said, my money's on the table, if he hasn't got the cash, I want the stamps or whatever they are, I'll give you five minutes to decide. And I leave, leaving the money on the table. And so then Alex takes their money and he switches it, and they think both amounts of money are on the table, and then he comes to speak to me to tell me that he's going to take their deal. And then we would, we would run, right? We would go to get in a car and run, or in this case, we would just go and hide in our little. And across the street is this guy's business partner and his friends. And Alex walks over with the money, and he shows it to me immediately. And it was Scottish money. We were in Glasgow, and Alex is English. We don't hold that against him. He's actually a very nice person. Um, but he hands me the money, and he goes, this isn't right. And I look at it and go, yeah, it's fake. The guys handed us counterfeit money. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so I turn to his business partner, he's right there, and I go, any idea why he's got, you know, three grand in counterfeit cash or whatever it was? And you, I saw his eyes just look up. Now I immediately know this guy has sent his business partner to the bank to take out real money, and he's turned up at this business deal oh, wow. with counterfeit cash. He was stealing from his business partner? Well, I, I, you notice I didn't say that. <laughs> you said that um, I cannot confirm or deny that but it just, it just felt this is really dodgy wow. but he's just done it on cameras recorded for the BBC yeah. All right. Yeah. so we're talking with the producers and we're saying what do we do and there's this other situation we knew about about a poker game being filmed I'm not saying that it was for us 
where somebody said something that was, you know, in, in the course of an anecdote, they admitted to something completely illegal. And the decision was made, this was years ago, and this was not our show, um, this thing that he admitted to was something that was really a problem. And what we did is, as producers said, look, here's the tapes, you're on film, leave. You've got everything. And that's, that's how that was handled. So how are we going to do this? Do we do the same situation? And I thought, well, you know, this is, you've got to be careful because we're in the middle of something here. We don't know what we're in the middle of. So what we did is we kept the cameras rolling and we walked in and we said, listen, we need to tell you this is a show called The Real Hustle. Uh, you're on video and you've just given us this money. And he was like a deer in the headlights. And we said, look, we don't know what to do, but look, here, we'll, we'll try and make something happen. So in the end, it had to be uh, reported to the police, I believe. Wow. And what this guy did, and I'm not saying he was the brightest tool, <laughs> the sharpest tool in the box. He went to the press and said, I just conned the real hustle. Oh, <laughs> wow. And we're reading this in the papers going, this guy's kidding, right? So wow. we, we put it on TV. And in, in the, uh, when hustles go wrong, you see this guy. And you can see him. He literally does not know he's being filmed. He has no idea. But there's a picture of him in the press with a fan of fake money. And I still can't believe he wasn't, you know, prosecuted. He's 3,000 pounds in, in fake money. But that's probably it's the most spectacular gone wrong I correct can Correct terminology is dollars here in the United States. You know, if you're going to get me on inflatable, I'm going to say dollars for you. So. <laughs> um, yeah, but, you know, pounds are what we use there, Dave. And, I'm pretty uh, sure we, we invented American language. Yes. You did, he, you did he invent did American language. He did the show in Glasgow. So <laughs> it wasn't dollars. I know this messing with him. By the way, I, I think it's really kind of you guys to to be so nice to Dave with all yeah. the problems that he's clearly got. Yes. Um, but yes. you know, yes. <laughs> and he does it so calmly, just with a, that great accent, and he's just like slap. It's just a technical note, but these microphones can be switched off. Does anybody? I actually, I shit? actually have to go uh, for my talk. And so not only were you insulting our guest, but now you're going to leave before the podcast. Well, actually, is over. I do want to get one thing before. I, I think we go. that's such a chicken move. I only slapped you once, Dave, but you want to leave. It's yeah. okay. No, I, I do. I do have a quick question before I do go. I, I, I honestly have a talk at that. This is about Bruce Hornsby. Stop. It's not. It's not. <laughs> if you were going to con Chris, how would you do it? And can you email me those specifics? Well, we're in the middle of it right now. But if you want to join in, then. Uh... <laughs> wait, wait. What? 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 Oh, my wallet's gone. <laughs> Where's Apollo? <laughs> Where is Apollo? That's always a good question. Yeah. So you have to go and give a speech. I do. I do, unfortunately. I, what? You go a... schedule the podcast at crazy times. Like lunch. Yeah, okay. So the lunch okay. thing, all right. No, no, no. You guys all know the story, right? If you listen to the podcast. And then the next month, I scheduled it after lunch. And guess how many months it's been since he's been on the podcast? Three. Right? So... After, it's been three months. It's been two. Okay. Yeah, you're right. It's been two. Two. Yeah. Two. After he said that he loved HD more more than anyone in the universe, yeah, he and, didn't even show up. And I do love HD more, but I happen to be flying to Hawaii. Okay, so I guess HD Hawaii more is more important than Hawaii. Than, yeah, I think HD more is more important. I didn't go to Hawaii. You know what, Chris? You know, yeah, just, how, about, how about this? You can you can replace me with somebody else, and you're not gonna have as much fun and excitement. For those of you not watching this and seeing this on video, you guys are a really cute couple. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, buddy. Oh, man. <laughs> no, but seriously, it's a, it's a pleasure to be on, and I apologize for not being able to, to stay. But, uh, I mean, I can't wait to listen to the rest of the podcast. And uh, one thing I do want to relate, though, is what you do so relates to everything that we do in social engineering. I mean, it's 100% that human interaction piece, and it has 100% to do with body language, behavior, what you can get away with. And you're more on the racy side of things. Like, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not confident enough to create something that's so outrageous that, you know, I feel like I can get away with it. Like, mine's very methodical. And, like, you know, you're, you have a whole different skill level on actually talking to people and going after people in a way that, you know, so ridiculous, but yet you make it, uh, you know, so comfortable for the other person to kind of believe in it and, and be scammed. And it's uh, something that's amazing. So I, I, aside from the whole disagreement between Bruce Hornsby and everything else, you're actually a pretty good dude and uh, pretty impressive for what you do. So. Besides, <laughs> besides the Bruce Hornsby deal, I never thought that sentence would be said to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, wait. Uh, this will be my ultimate determination whether or not I like you or not. Doctor Who? 
You into, you into Dr. Hoodle? Um, I'm into, uh, yeah, Tom Baker's my doctor. Tom here. Baker, okay. And That's everything good. after that is a fail, All in right. my opinion. <laughs> I might, my kid hates far, me for saying that, but uh, yeah, I'm a doctor. Baker, okay. Baker's one of the best doctors. Uh, Tom is the best. I All right, think. cool. We got that. All right, thanks, guys. All right. Take care. <laughs> See you, Dave. Bye, Dave. Have good, have fun on your speech, man. Thanks, man. Thanks for missing my talk, Chris. Uh, thank, uh, thanks no, for missing my talk. No problem. No problem. I'm just gonna stay and, and support our guest who flew in from the UK <laughs> to uh, you know to, to be on our podcast. Yeah. Hey, look, we have a question now that Dave's leaving. Yeah. Yes, sir. We will never play Bruce Wayne's me again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> can't make those decisions when I'm gone. I can actually. Yes, sir. I um, think this guy's waiting until Dave leaves the room to talk about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> <is great. laughs> it's okay. We, we just another minute. He'll be gone. It's all. Okay. It's all okay. Is he gonna hug everybody on his way out the so. door? Yes. Everybody, everybody between here and the door, hug Dave. Yeah. Hug, hug Dave, guys. <laughs> hug Dave. There you go. Okay, give Dave a hug. There oh, we go. He's yeah. literally yeah. hugging everyone. But only the guys. On only the, the guys. You can't see this. Oh, he's actually going he in is. the aisles now. He's hugging people. He's <laughs> hugging everyone. No, she doesn't want to be hugged. No, no, don't touch her. <laughs> I, I, I don't even... <laughs> We saw Why didn't some you hug her? Why didn't you hug her? She feels left out. We saw some uncomfortable faces here. <laughs> okay, you know what? Don't, don't tell him anything good about himself, please. Uh, oh, oh, almost, oh, almost. That's, that's, oh, that's, oh, that's, oh, that's a, that yeah. That's, 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 yeah, that's, that's a, okay, this, that's a this big, is, oh, okay. Oh, boy. And uh, <laughs> I hope he's hugging people from here all the way to... To Paris. Yeah, yeah, he's just like, <laughs> just random yeah. dealers. Dave's and, uh, exit has lasted 10 minutes. Yeah, Dave. Okay. And everybody, Dave, Dave, Dave has left the building. Dave, Dave has left the building. Yes! Yeah. No, he's oh, back! God. And he's hugging more people. <laughs> <laughs> he can't stop touching people. Yes. <laughs> And he's gone. And he's gone. <laughs> okay. Okay. A question. All right. Now, what do you want to say about Dave? Um, <laughs> let's say uh, I'm a fish. Um, is there some general way that I can notice that I'm on the hook or that I'm in this cone bubble? Mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, if, if you're... Um, if you said, so if, if I'm a fish, which is, is a, a term for a sucker or a, a mark, uh, is there any way I can notice that I'm on the hook? And it's, it's a hard one, because once you're on the hook, you've got your own ego to deal with, because your own ego doesn't want to admit that you're in the middle of a con. And how the con's been played, if it's been tailored to you well, makes it unlikely that you're going to wake yourself up. So yes, you could step back, and you could take some advice, and you could get yourself out of there. But the problem is, is once you're hooked and you're on the line, then it really takes a certain amount of self-awareness mm -hmm. for you to just kind of look at everything with a different viewpoint. Because I'm putting blinkers on you. I'm, I want you just to look ahead. For you to take those off and then look around, yes, it happens. But that's usually a failure on the, on the part of the corn artist. or it's an inter, you know, somebody has intercepted the con from the outside, in my experience, anyway. So there's no general demons that I have to be, like, watching out? My own inside demons. Uh, your own, do, do you want to look for your own inside demons? Uh, I would take that as meaning that, you know, we always talk about what, what drives a con, and a lot of people think it's just greed or naivety, but it, one of the things that drives most cons, in my opinion, isn't greed, it's need. And it's not just a need for money, it's not just a need for things, it's a need for human value in yourself, right? That's an inner demon we've all got. And I think that your own, your own ego is the, big, is the big problem here. If you can be self-aware enough to recognize, you know, that you've, you've maybe entered into something that you... We always say, if it seems too good to be true, it, it probably is. But that's really something you can only recognize from the beginning. Um, once they've got you on, on the line, uh, you just, 
is how do we make you self-aware? How do we make you admit to yourself that you're on the line? And I swear to you, this is true. Sorry, no, sorry, Chris. Okay, I swear to you, most people would rather be conned than admit they're being conned. I don't understand it. I'm not a psychologist uh, other than a practical. Um, but it just seems to be this really weird element. I can't understand it. The one thing I say all the time, and I really want to come back to this over and over again, if we want to beat this, some of us want to beat it, and some of us want to take advantage of it, I get that, but if you really want to beat it, it's really simple. Stop blaming the victims. Let the victims feel free to come out and say, I just got conned, and have people understand and accept what happened to them and stop saying, how could you be so stupid? That's the thing that stops people from coming forward. Yeah. If we do that, if we do that one thing, then we'll make it a lot harder, but never impossible. So I have a follow-up question because you're saying that basically once we're on the hook, it's, it's almost impossible to get off. So how do you avoid getting on the hook? What are the steps that you take so you don't get hooked? Um, don't trust anyone. Don't talk to anyone. Uh, stay at home. <laughs> never leave your house. <laughs> uh, yeah, and switch off the internet. Um, how, you know, it's, it's really simple. I know what I really want in life, and when it gets handed to me, I'm, I'm always worried about it. You know, I, I'm really worried about selling my house or my car simply because I know people are going to come and say, oh, this is a beautiful house, but you're that guy off the real hustle. <laughs> Get lost, <laughs> you know. Um, so how do you, look, at the end of the day, you've just got to, you've just got to protect yourself with, you know, most people get conned because they get involved with something they really don't understand. You know, they take part in something that they really don't fully appreciate what the dangers are, or they, they kind of pretend they know more than they, they really know. And one of the best ways of protecting yourself is just to be honest with yourself and with others. You know, I don't really understand this. I need to take some advice. That will shut down 90% of the scams. Oh, no, you don't need to do that. Or why don't you call this guy? Oh, really? You want me to call this guy? Um, you know, just being cautious. And wh where's the information coming from? That's another really simple question. Where's the information coming from? And uh, you be careful. But you, it's impossible. Yeah. It is impossible. And also, you know, anything you do, if you, can, if you can kind of prime yourself, no matter how confident you are in a situation, to stop and step back, no matter what it is, if you could do that, which is difficult, especially when I'm... Uh, you know, restricting your time and forcing you to make decisions and making you panic. You know, the yeah. situation comes up, you've got to do it now. That's how so many people get caught. You know, and you know, listening to the calls, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there going, well, I would go this way and I'm, I'm probably sure I'd be breaking your rules, but there's so many ways of getting more out of a potential mark as a con artist. And I would say most of them depend on empathy. You know, Jen was on a call yesterday. Remember, she said the guy said, oh, I'm, I'm, "I've got to hire two people." Mm. I would have jumped in right away if if it wasn't in these conditions. And you know, I was oh, that is so difficult to get good people because you know he's going to go, "Yeah, right," because it, you just know that's something that you can connect with people on. And when Jen was making those connections, you know, all of those little things, all of those little empathies. And um, when she came on yesterday, I I, I said she's gonna, I knew she was going to be really good at this. I mean, not just because of her her presentation, as soon as she was talking, you could tell she just had that yeah. professionalism, but that, that way that, that people can relate to. And if you can get that, so, you know, I've, I've, I've been for, I've met with TV companies and say, look, we've got this great, great idea for a con show. And they take one look at me and say, well, yeah, but you don't look like a con man. <laughs> That's kind of the point. <laughs> How does you a know? con man look? <laughs> yeah, but they want dog the con man, right? You know, a little pencil mustache, yeah. slick back hair. <laughs> and, um, but really, con artists don't look like you or me because they look like everybody. Yeah. You know, that's just kind of the thing. And I think that's one of the... One of the things that we're never going to get our heads around is that it could come from anywhere, and it could even come from people you know and like and respect or even love. You know, you just never know. One of the things about con artists that I've found is that the, the guys that would go after the granny, right, those guys, there really is no filter and there really is no limit to what they do say to get the steal, right? And to some extent, it's addicting. You know, it's not just getting the money. It's, not, it's just getting that steal, getting that thrill. I'm lucky I got to do it 400 times and not go to jail or not feel like, you know, I'd, um, 
you know, want to kill myself later. Uh, but genuinely, I think that empathy for the victims is, is one of the most powerful things. Just saying to someone, you're an idiot, it's obviously a scam, yeah. is not going to stop them getting involved in the scam. So this is fascinating. To me, this is a fascinating topic because you're like identical to us in a different field, right? So we, you know, we focus on helping people learn about social engineering so mm -hmm. they don't get scammed or conned by a social right. engineer. And phishing is one of the biggest methods that that is perpetrated today. So what we do is we fish our customers. Mm -hmm. We actually send them, you know, fraudulent emails, but the results aren't stealing their their right. lives. It's they click a link and they get education. And like you, you know, last year, you know, we sent millions of phishing emails without having to go to prison, mm -hmm. which feels good. But at the same time, if you say to every person that clicks, you're a moron. You know, you click the phishing link then no one learns anything. They hate you, they hate the education, right. and they don't walk away being better at it. But, so it's just, it's almost like what you're saying is awareness is the only method to potentially be saved from being scammed or caught. I find that you can help a lot of people, and I, I do this you know, when I talk to people. We, we get involved with deception on different levels. So I can teach them a simple scam like a change raising scam, you know, where you, you're basically getting them to give you more money in change. Uh, or even teach them a really simple magic trick. And it sounds ridiculous, but as soon as you get people to think in that deceptive way, and you teach them something really simple, and then you ask them the question, how could you make this more deceptive? Or how could you get more from it? And they start thinking about it. The, the how they did it, you know, the methodology, is the first thing. Once they've got a hold of that, and you start mm. asking them to put their imagination into it, they start getting more involved with this idea of deception and coming up with all sorts of crazy, interesting, sometimes terrible, but really yeah. creative stuff. And then when you turn around and say, now let's talk about how this would happen in the real world where it would impact you directly, they can relate to it. Because that's one of the biggest problems I find with most companies and most uh, um, people who are trying to protect from deception is they just can't relate to the way that we're, we're thinking. Yeah. And we're, the, the, the guys out there and the girls, of course, who are trying to cheat them, are thinking. They can't relate to that. They just think, well, that's very unlikely. Yep. Who's going to go to that trouble? Well, we are. Yeah. And um, if we do it for them in a, in, a, in a way that's safe, then it's engaging, and I think it helps everybody, um, yeah. except for the bad guys, of course. Hey, how's it going? First off, I wanted to say this is becoming my favorite area of DEF CON. Year after year, I just can't get enough of this. Uh, uh, I got here a little late, so if I missed something, I apologize. But yesterday, there was a session on Twitter, ISIS, and ISIL, which in many respects, in my opinion, is, is, a, is a very hardcore social media con of it in itself. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm curious if you guys would, could respond on that in the area of knowing, because I believe that's what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing, there's a lot of people who are literally conning their way in in the form of social media and terroristic efforts through Twitter, like the ISIS and ISIL groups. And, you know, I'm just curious what your thoughts are, or in that regards, in the sense of how they're using con tactics to manipulate yeah. and, you know, obviously uh, take advantage of whomever. You know, one of, thank you. Uh, so the, the question is, are, are groups like ISIL and ISIS, same thing, of course, uh, are they using the same tactics as con artists in order to attract and recruit people to their cause? And the answer is absolutely yes, they are. Um, it's easy to argue that religion is one of the greatest scams of all time. Uh, I'm not a religious guy. I don't agree with that statement as it's put. I think organized religion, in other words, how religion is manipulated by people for their own causes, is an example of the scams that are out there. In other words, I've got my own agenda, and I'm going to basically take a belief system that you're attracted to and use that as leverage to make you um, respond to my agenda. Right now, it's happening here in America. It's happening, you know, you know, the guy who wants money to buy his own plane. Tell me that's not a scam, you know. And everybody, you know, I, I'm personally, genuinely upset by, you know, forgive me, it is a very American thing, but it is happening in the UK as well. Using the term Muslim as a as as interchangeable with terrorist because that's really not fair, frankly. Uh, Christians were, and I'm a Christian, and my family's Christian, all of that, we're, you know, historically as guilty as anybody. But when you look back, it's kind of for the same reasons, you know, it's for these causes, where people get behind the cause, and then they get manipulated into doing obscene, awful, dreadful things. 
And at the heart of it is somebody who's just got a really awful agenda. And they, they know what they're doing, right? They're drumming this up. They know what they're doing. So when we look at it, we have to try and relate to it. Because if we can relate to it, we get into that not stop blaming the victim thing. I'm sorry, I don't care if you're religious or if you, you believe in anything and you cut someone's head off. That's it, you're screwed in my book. No matter what the reasons were, if you did that, I, no excuses, right? But I still think that the problem, as much as dealing with that, that is a surface problem. It's getting to that communication system, that network of how, I, I absolutely love, by the way, that these guys got catfished last week. You know, by those girls. I love that that happened. And I would love to be doing it to them. They've, these guys have got so much money, I really want to go after it. And I know you, a lot of people in this room do too. But <clears throat> what's happening is, I think, just a really manipulative, directed, cynical attempt to build an empire on the back of belief. And that belief is corrupted into this awful situation. And the techniques are just like scams because they're going after people who want something and they're offering them what they want. And they're going for it and they're investing their lives in it. And suddenly we have this, you know, this awful situation. But it's happened before and it'll happen again. And again, if we just go after the surface of it, if we run after those guys and, you know, yes, we want to, you know, we want to fight them, right? But let's get to the core of it. And yes, they're using information technology to build an army, but I bet you we're doing a good job of getting at that from the inside as well. I just hope we do a better job than we've been doing to date. So the answer is yes, it's all cons and scams. And I've got to say, this has got to be the most dreadful in, possibly in history, right? And, and you know, I think um, along the line of what Paul was saying in the beginning, the, the way that their methodology, if you look at the way that they're attracting mm -hmm. um, people to join, it's, it's finding their need, right? Finding what it is that they desire. So whether it's money, the promise of wives, the promise of success, the, the desire to fight for something that has a greater meaning or cause, and then they feed that person those desires. Mm -hmm. And once you, once you find that, then you see these conversions, right? People leaving their home countries or their faiths or their families to go and, and fight this, this new cause. Um, and and when you when you you know after the fact when you look at and the government finds it and then the news and media release these type of conversations you can see it clearly how it, how it was working yeah right because it is um, and I agree with Paul much more malicious and disgusting but it's basically like a phishing email or like a scam watching them fulfill the desires and needs for these people to them it's asking them it's, the request it's building the bubble it's showing it's, 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 it's Showing them how to interpret the world around them based on their, on on their building belief. In other words, they're they're actually reconstructing their belief system for them. So they interpret the world around them according to, you know, who they're talking to. And I th I think one of the problems with all of this is we have to recognize most people, most people are intrinsically good. And some of and a lot of these people are ending up in 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 Syria. How is that happening? And I think we really have to get a, a, an appreciation of how it's happening and fight it on its own terms. And just, you know, what we're doing, what we're doing publicly, what I'm aware of publicly isn't enough. We need to go deeper. And uh, I think we can compete with them. But again, it's getting into that bubble. And they can't break themselves out, as we talked about. And how do we break them out? It's not easy. They're going to resist the truth. Of course, you know, who knows what the truth is, right? Melvin? Hang on, our mic's not on. Oh, oh, switch maybe? There we go. My question is, how do you unwrap your mind when you go back out into public so that you can have a healthy social interaction with people on what they, everybody would consider a normal level? So you mean after I've conned people, how do I talk to people on a normal level? Right, like I've worked in jail for 22 years. Mm -hmm. um, with a very free-flowing inmate. And I'm now, this month, going out into the real world. I either completely trust the person and, you know, I babble about everything or I don't talk to anybody at all. And I'm, I'm coping with that. How do you do it since you scam people? How do you unravel that, put it away, 
and then go back to dealing with people in a normal manner. Well, it's interesting. I, so the question is, how do I deal with people in a normal manner, you know, pulling all these cons and scams? Well, it's easier for me. Because, you know, if I'm a con man, I'm a real con man, then my motivation is constantly to, to steal, to, to achieve the steal, the win, right? But that's not what I am. Um, I am fortunate in that I've been allowed to play in that sandbox in a, in a form of controlled reality. And, uh, and the truth is that, in, you know, up here talking to you guys and, you know, being in front of an audience, I am, it's easier for me to have a conversation because we've, got, we've all got an agenda. I think I know what I'm talking about, but that might be a con, right? And it's easier for me. And in, the, in, the cons, in, in, in a con or if I'm acting, you know, I'm an actor as well, or if I'm working on a film and I know what I'm doing, then absolutely, I'm perfectly able to function normally. And, you know, at, but in a normal conversation, I, I don't know, I get lost. You know, normal human interactions are usually quite hard for me. Uh, I suspect I'm in a group who feel the same way sometimes. But it is, you know, it is easier for me to be, you know, much more confident, much more verbose, um, much more engaging with people when I'm in that, that environment. And, uh, you know, I have cheated at cards. And, uh, you no, know, I know. Shocking. Yeah. I have genuinely cheated, and you know, Shocking. it was easier for me because it was it was quite quiet. You know, you just you, and then when I got into doing the TV shows and actually pulling scams, I found that that confidence I had physically with the the stuff I was doing cheating, I could actually kind of convey that to human interaction. But it is very much the same thing. It's what I've kind of trained myself to do. So I don't come out and have a problem with how, how do I stop conning people. I just come out and go, yeah, oh, I wish I was as good at talking to people as I was it, you know, stealing their money. <laughs> um, so it's, it, yeah, and I, I find some con artists are the same. You know, I, I talk in the book, there was a guy I knew, and I kind of admitted it in the book, there's a guy I knew for years and we were quite friendly and he was a real con artist. And at one point he knew I had a bunch of money on me and he went for it with a scam, you know, and I suddenly found myself on the other side of the table, you know. And uh, I just realized that, you know, the fact that we were friends essentially didn't make any difference to him, because it's a you know it's a scorpion and the frog, no matter what you know, and it's just his nature, and it's what he does. I don't believe it's my nature. It's just something I'm very familiar with, and I can appreciate. I'm a connoisseur of cons. <laughs> Thank you. You're very welcome. Paul, I think you made an interesting point about um, controlling the bubble, controlling information yeah. that your marks have access to. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I, it, it is something that we talk about in terms of uh, manipulation technique, how you, you control people's access to information that is legitimate as opposed to information that you can tr control. Well, you know, first of all, you can direct people to um, uh, positive sources for your purposes, uh, you know, so you, you can find it. But one of, one of the keys to a good con is to bury a productive truth within easily verifiable, uh, a productive lie within easily verifiable truths. So in other words, you know, the truth hides amongst the lies, but that truth is what everything hinges, uh, that lie is what everything hinges upon. Uh, the other thing is to, is, is, you know, as we said earlier, is to prepare your victim for what he's going to be told by people who are going to try and, uh, you know, dis dissuade him or her or to, uh, you know, to break through that bubble so that they, they interpret it in a way that, that, that is, again, productive and may even put them deeper into the scam. So you can prepare a lot of that. But the most important, you know, most of the thing is, look, just don't tell anybody about this because if anybody finds out, it'll all, it'll all go away. And so we isolate them, mostly. So the isolation is, is usually, you know, when people say I was conned and all this happened, well, why didn't you say something? Well, because they said don't and this is why. And I believe that. So controlling information is, you know, we can now do it in so many ways. I mean, you can get, you can, you can let people look at a, a real website, but you can, you can divert that, right? You can control that. If you can get access to somebody's technology physically, you can literally decide everything that they see. Um, so the world is changing around us and where we find our information isn't just controllable, it's highly predictable. You know, simply making sure, 
you know, bogus information. You know, going into Wikipedia and changing information can be highly productive. So here's a quick story. Um, anybody here a magician? Any magicians here? Oh, <laughs> hello, Shane. <laughs> So you might not know this story. Shane uh, is a very dear friend of mine and is uh, a fellow um, enthusiast of a book called The Expert at the Card Table. Um, uh, and uh, it is written by an author called S.W. Erdnays. S.W. Erdnays backwards is E.S. Andrews, and we still don't know who it was. And so there's a lot of discussion in the magic community about who, th who this is. And it's kind of like this buried treasure. Whoever really finds a smoking gun, or as we like to say, the smoking deck of cards as, as to who that guy is, you know, that's like a big deal, really a huge deal. And we still don't know. We've got really smart guys looking at it. We still don't know. And so they're, on the Wikipedia page, they talk about, you know, who the potential authors may be, and there's some candidates, right? And so one day, somebody goes in and adds two candidates. Uh, one is a guy, I think his name was Robert Milliken, and uh, another one who were scientists who, had a, who were interested in, in the art of magic and hired um, uh, a man by the name of, in writing, Professor Hoffman to write a book about how... Are you familiar with this part, the story, Shane? Right, but are you familiar with the, 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 the physicist who hired Hoffman? It's, it, it was in the Wikipedia page for quite a while. And um, I'm in the back of a car driving to a thing called Erdnasium, where a bunch of um, people who study Erdnas and read about it and look into the history gathered in Montana, the potential home of one of the authors, son of a senator. This was written in 1902, by the way, a long time ago. And as we're driving, the three of us are driving in the car, Richard Hatch, who is one of the um, preeminent researchers who has his own candidates, mentioned this story. And my, my ears came up, and he talked about how he had spent a couple of months looking into these scientists to find out if there's any connection between them and Hoffman, and he still couldn't find anything. At which point I turned to him and I say, Richard, I put that up in Wikipedia on April 1st. And he looked at me and he said, I've spent months researching this. <laughs> And I said, it was April 1st. It seemed obvious. And uh, he, so he was far from happy. But it reminded me that, you know, all I had to do was just go in and put an update to Wikipedia. And whether I'm doing it for this author of a magic book or a, a cheating book, or whether I'm doing it for something that I'm trying to convince somebody on, and I'm not saying that we manipulated Wikipedia for real hustle. <laughs> but Wikipedia is great. It's always top, right? And so they would look, they would check, their information would be, in quotes, verified, and all it took for us was to go in, make a change, and then go in and change it back. So people rely on things like Google when we all know that we can get in there and intercept that information, right? So, you know, how do we control information? We just got to know what they're going to do. And we kind of know what everybody's going to do. First thing they do is go to the top of their uh, web browser, type in whatever words we've told them, the key words, and if we've, you know, if we've planted or intercepted the information, you could practically sell them anything right then and there, you know? Uh, I was wondering if you had a recommended reading list of thing, books that influenced you over the years. Uh, the Art of the Con by R. Paul Wilson is an excellent <laughs> book, if you haven't, yeah. <laughs> Um, I do think the security, uh, the social engineering books are really valuable. I genuinely do. It's not just because I'm sitting here and he has whiskey. Um, <laughs> but you. I think if you really, you know, magic's a really interesting thing. You can learn a lot from the way that magicians think. And I'm surprised that only a couple of hands went up here because deception is deception is deception, right? And the way that people with a deceptive mindset think is very different from the way that most people think. And I would say most people here have that mindset. <laughs> and so I would look into other fields and kind of just see how things are done. I mean, there's a great book called uh, The Magic of Alan Wakeling by Jim Steinmeier. It's available on Amazon, sold to the public. And in there, you can find out how illusions are done. And you can learn about Alan Wakeling. 
And just, get, just going through that book, or any book by Jim Steinmeier where he talks about how magicians have worked on things, will just give you an appreciation of a certain mindset that you may be able to apply, uh, hopefully to positive purposes. But I would, I would say go look at the books of Jim Steinmeier. Um, research anything where you think people are, are thinking on two different levels. That methodology that's concealed and that final effect that's interpreted by uh, the final recipient or Speaking artist. Of my yeah. phone. Sure. That answer your question? Is that, is that good? Yeah. Shane. Hey, Paul. Paul. Uh, more of a request. You did a, a series of videos with Titanic Thompson's kind of right hand guy mm -hmm. recently ish. Could you share like the best story, your favorite story from talking to him? I guess you need a little preamble for Titanic Thompson too. Uh, yeah, so um, Titanic Thompson was uh, one of the greatest. I won't say con man, he was a gambler, but he was a, he was a proposition better, and he would kind of fix the proposition bets. And he hung around with gamblers, he played cards, sometimes legitimately, he would hire professional mechanics, card cheats to work in the games for him and stuff, but, so he was kind of honest, kind of dishonest, but he was very famous as the guy that would bet on anything. So, you know, for example, he would go down the beach, was, you know, playing a huge card game to take a break to go for dinner. They'd walk down the beach in, in uh, Miami and they'd see a tent and sticking out this tent, right, this big long tent, it's this enormous pair of feet. Somebody's asleep in there. And they would bet on the height of the guy. And he had basically gone out and found a midget, a small person with very large feet, <laughs> and paid him to set up the tent, you know, because he would just make sure he got the lowest bet and the guy would come out. And they would all know they'd been cheated but it would be so amusing they'd pay up the bet, right? Um, but he had lots of things that he would do. And one of them was, you know, he, would, he, would, he was an incredible golfer. And Lee Trevino, the golfer, actually was one of the people that worked with him and helped set people up. And he could play a very good game right-handed, but his perfect game was left-handed. So he would beat people right-handed and then offer to do it for three times the money, but he would play left-handed, <laughs> right? You know, that's the kind of thing he would do. And there are so many great Titanic Thompson stories, but I think the one that went wrong is the one I like the most, where he, he was with a guy on a train, and the guy's name was Tony, and he was a big Italian guy. He used to work for the mob, and he was a threatening guy. He was the guy you sent to get your money, right? So he's kind of like a big, slow-witted guy, maybe, but huge. And he owned a, a restaurant now. That's what he did for a living. And he was sharing a train a carriage with uh, Titanic Thompson, and uh, he's looking at him and he gets an idea. And everybody knows that Tony's a bit dumb. And he says to Tony, and they're sitting in this train carriage, I imagine alone at night, lights are flying by the window. And Titanic Thompson, who was a tall guy, but a thin guy, not a huge guy like this guy, looks at him and says, Tony, doesn't it bother you that everybody thinks you're such a dummy? And Tony says, you know, Ty, I, I, I like you, you're a friend, but you should, be more respectful. And he says, it just bothers me. I like you, Tony, but everyone thinks you're so dumb. I mean, you can't even spell your own name. I can spell my own name. Oh, yeah, maybe your own name because you've practiced, but you couldn't spell, I don't know, a 10-letter word. I sure could. I, well, you know, if I learned one. What about rhinoceros? Can you? And he said, you know, said something. That, I see kids here, so I won't repeat what Tony said. And he says, what about uh, anthropoid? Do you know how to spell that? And he said, no. I'll tell you what, I'll teach you. And if at the end of this journey, you can spell rhinoceros and anthropoid perfectly, I'll pay for all of our carriage fees. How's that? And so Tony practices all the way there. A-N-T-H-R-O-P-O-I-D, R-H-I, and he spells them constantly until he's got it literally to rope. And at the end, he says, okay, spell them. And he spells them both perfectly. And he pays up, and he pays him 100 bucks or something. And then a week later, he breaks up this big card game, and they, all these gamblers go with uh, Titanic Thompson to Tony's restaurant, right? Where he has paid off one of the waitresses. And he's sitting, and the guys notice that he's watching Tony talk to all the guests, and say, why are you looking at Tony? He says, you know the thing about Tony nobody knows? Everybody thinks he's this big dummy. But he's like, he reads all these books, and he's, he's so well read. I mean, you know, he, he, the guy's amazing. And everyone laughs. They think he's, he says, oh, no. I mean, he's amazing. He used to do spelling bees as a kid. 
And he can spell all these crazy words, and everyone's laughing. He says, I'll bet you. And he said, oh, no, 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 we're not going to let you fool us. He said, no, listen. He calls over the waitress. He says, listen, do you know any 10 little words? And she says, sure. Write some down. And she writes down five 10 little words. Fettuccine, cannelloni, restaurant, rhinoceros, and anthropoid. And so the gamblers look at this list, and they say, well, fettuccine and cannelloni, you know, those are Italian words. He might get that right by accident. Uh, restaurant is written on the window. We're not going to give him that. And so they all choose rhinoceros. And so he calls Tony over and he says, hey, Tony, he brings out a hundred bucks. Spell rhinoceros. And Tony says, A-N-T-H-R-O-B-O-R-T. And Titanic Thompson has to pay everybody off. (laughs) It's one of my favorite stories. That's a great story. Any other questions? We're coming up on the near the end, guys. So, um, if there's no more, no more people. Okay. I think we're well, good. Oh, we got oh, one we more. We do. We have one. Okay. Hello. Hey. Yeah. Thanks. Love the podcast. Thank you. Uh, this question, and this says the last little bit. We talked a little bit about how you can protect yourself, but we saw all the social engineering going on all 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 through this session. What are some of the most effective training techniques you've seen for sort of more larger groups of people like employees or other places? I think some, a lot of what I see at work is maybe not, not really all that effective. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think um, it, it kind of really lends itself to what we're discussing here with, with Paul is um, we, we find that CBT's long, like 60 minute trainings just don't work. Gamifying things don't work, right? It doesn't, it, it, it's not a, it's not a repeatable process that people want to pay attention to. So what we have found works is exactly what Paul says he does for his job, which is we, we commit the scams, we commit the acts on the employees, but with different intent. We fish all the employees every month. We fish them. We, we call them on the phone and we, we scam them. Um, we'll try to break into a building. And again, all the intent is different. And then we tell them how we did it, and we give them education on how to catch it. And this is a repeatable process that we can do every month. And we find with fishing, when you do that, um, I'll give you a couple examples. We have a company we've been working with for four years on this process, and they're now you know, well below the 10% mark on average click, but here's the big thing, because click ratio is just one aspect. It's not really that important. Um, they have a 72% reduction in malware-related incidents on their network. 72% is huge on a mal- malware-related incidents on their network because of this program. Because what we did is we educated people how to look at emails and see which ones are scams, and now they're not clicking the things that they were clicking before. And we've done the same thing with vishing, and people have now recognized how to pick out a vishing a call, and we're seeing a reduction in scams on that. Um, so it, you have to, awareness is the only way, but you can tell people all day long. Right? I mean, we're up here, we're hearing these stories, but I guarantee you that in an hour from now, Paul can probably scam anybody in the room with something. And we, we just I can hurt. scam everybody in the room right now. Okay, you can? Yeah, you want to do that? Yeah, do it. All right. So here's, here's, here's the thing. Some of you may have... Who saw my talk a couple of years ago? No, you guys are out. Um, <laughs> here's, a, here's a great proposition bet. It's very simple. I bet people... Usually this is at a bar because alcohol is a factor. I bet people that I can make them turn their hands over without touching them, using nothing but the power of my mind. Okay? I'm going to do that on everybody in the audience. So everybody put your hands out in front of you. Both your hands, please. You guys too. All right? Palm up like this. And everyone who just turned their hands over. (laughs) Okay, you suck. You You owe me 10 bucks each. But that, but that's the no, thing. That wasn't the deal ahead of time. There was no money involved. Okay. <laughs> but that's you know the big lesson isn't 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 just awareness. Awareness is important. The key and the reason it's so effective to actually target and let them experience it from their end is is not awareness. It's acceptance because it's so easy to dismiss this as it won't happen to me or that nobody's ever going to take the trouble to do that. As soon as they get a, a taste of the possibility of it then immediately people are far better educated 
Um, the only thing I do on, on the other side is, that, is I, I like to, as you're doing here, I like to give them the experience of being the con artist yeah. because that really, really wakes you up. I mean, I walk around in a constant sense of paranoia, right? But, and that won't protect me. <laughs> but there is that thing of once you've got a taste for it, you kind of, you know, you kind of recognize it when it's being served to you sometimes. And so you, all you need is enough. You have to remember, most of the things that go after people isn't really that sophisticated. So, yeah, you can help people by giving them a taste of both sides of the table. Yeah. And, that, and that actually fits perfectly, again, with our industry, right? So the, 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 the final part of your question is you could do that all day long, but until people start accepting the training and, and actually learning from it, and you have to be able to adapt and adjust with your population. Because you may see, oh, this doesn't work for, mm -hmm. for my, my group, but this worked well. And you have to be able to constantly adapt and adjust so that way you're getting the most the maximum effect out of it. But it's a, hard, it's a hard sell right now in corporate America because the people who are writing the checks sometimes don't see the benefit in taking that action or they feel you're victimizing your population. But I, my answer to that is, what's more victimizing? to be educated by being scammed a couple times or your education comes because you actually clicked the fish or got scammed and you lost, you know, you got breached or you lost all your money or something like that. I, I'd rather, I'd rather the, the latter, I'd rather the former. I'd rather get a phishing email from my company, learn and not ever get scammed for real to me. One of the, one of the things that happened on Real Hustle right at the very beginning I think applies here. Uh, the first season we did was kind of experimental. Nobody had ever done this before. And we had to find our way into how we were going to handle people we conned. Because are, are they going to sign the release? Are they going to punch me in the face? Has happened. Um, or are, you know, what's going to happen? And there's this kind of really interesting thing that happens when you say everything's okay. You, you haven't lost anything. Suddenly they're, you know, they're malleable in a way that they would be great for a con. But they are, they are malleable in, in, su in such that they want, to ex they want to explain why they responded the way that they did. And that's why you've got all those interviews for people on the show. And what happened on the show that almost blew this was on our pilot, we did a sort of version of Three Card Monty. And we had this guy, and we all sort of walked away and left this guy standing on the beach in Brighton on his own. And that's how we realized he'd been scammed, right? And... Uh, the first time I saw that take, um, the producer at the time had a, a giant graphic of the word sucker that slammed onto his head, which he thought would make great television. And I said, well, that would make great television for one season. No one would ever want to be on the show again. And by being kind and being understanding to the victims, we had five people, this is the number, one, two, three, four, five, 11 seasons, 452 scams. We had five people who said, I'm not signing a release. All right? That kindness thing was really important. And I think the same is true with the companies that are hiring um, companies like yours. Yep. It's not just about informing people. It's not just about giving them a taste of it. It's about making them feel um, that that was a valuable process and also making them feel that if it happened for real, even if they fell for it, they should report it immediately and there would be complete understanding within yeah. the company. If they put it into the disciplinary structure of if you give away information, that ultimately makes people hide the fact. And so you kind of have to find that balance of giving people a taste for it as sort of a trade-off for it not being um, something they'll get fired for. Yeah. You know, you can find that balance. 100%. I mean, yeah. we actually have a thing we always do with our clients is we start off by telling them anyone who clicks can't, can't be fired because you'll be replacing your whole population within the course of a few months. You will, right? Mm -hmm. So you got you got you got to accept this. It cannot be fear-based education. It doesn't work. If, if we're a company and Michelle clicks and gets fired, the only reason I'm not clicking or I'm looking at every email is because I'm afraid. Uh, I'm not really learning anything. I'm not learning how to be aware. So that's 100% true. Um, you've got to get people to buy in and you've got to be kind about it and you, just making people feel stupid. Like we don't employ, uh, employ that principle, there's no patch for human stupidity. You see those shirts everywhere? We don't, that's not our motto. It's leave people feeling better for having met you. That's our motto. Whether you're doing SE or whether you're training them. 
and it works. I mean, it works amazingly well when you do that. And then you have clients that stay with you for four, five, six years doing the same thing, and you see these massive reductions in, in those numbers. So that, again, should hire Paul as like a spokesperson. That accent, you can probably close some deals for us. Oh, yeah, I'm available. I take a very healthy percentage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Paul, if people want to find out more about you online, where do they go? Uh, you can go to uh, uh, conartist.tv. And there's a whole bunch of stuff on there that about me. Sounds like a site. www.conartist.tv. Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, <laughs> don't, don't click on anything on that website. The conartist.tv, <laughs> and uh, you can check that out. That kind of negates the whole. Yeah, give them your website. Don't click yeah, on anything yeah, on yeah. this website. <laughs> <laughs> okay, click on everything. It's click okay. on everything. Um, and uh, and you can check out the Real Hustle um, online. You know, Netflix. Um, I, uh, I think I think almost all of it's on YouTube now. Yeah. Um, it's all out there. There's also a show if you if you look for Scammed History Channel, which is a two-hour thing. Where um, the interesting thing about Scammed as opposed to Real Hustle, Real Hustle, we had to say to the BBC, "Look, it's been done. We're going to do it because it's been done." And that was like a really important thing to the BBC. With Scammed, they said, "Can you pull the Nigerian Prince 419 scam mm -hmm. on an American businessman?" And we know that everybody, it's, it's, on, it's on the commercials, right? I mean, it's so hard to do that. So I rewrote 419 in a way that I felt somebody would fall for it. And then they gave me the most difficult guy I could have, I, I really could have gotten. He was really tough. And um, in actual fact, as I say in the book, we changed the scam on him. We changed him to, you know, we changed the scam to actually just stealing his money outright, but then scamming him into the position where his money was kind of on the table was the hard part. But uh, if you watch that, you'll see me jockeying back and forth with some really, you know, a really difficult customer. Um, that's, that, I think, was a really great show as well. But it was more about me reinventing and re-engineering based not only on the people they gave me, but on the, um, you know, kind of, you know, 419 started as a Spanish prisoner a long time ago. And so now it's, it, can, it can change. And if, here's one of the problems. If you say to someone, this is what a scam is, and they're just looking for that, they're not really looking for what the scam is because the scams evolve constantly. Yeah. And I just wanted to prove that. And I think scam did that. And um, I, like I say, I hope we get to do more. But it really is that thing of making the victim the star. Yeah. Um, not because they were the victim, but because they were um, human. Yeah. And Here they were we hacked. Yeah. So conars.tv, uh, if you want to... Follow us, uh, Social Engineer Inc. or SOC Engineer Inc. is our Twitter handle, Human Hackers. The other one uh, is social-engineer.org, social-engineer.com. And if you're still on IRC, which I know many of us are, the uh, irc.freenode.net network, we have a channel there, social-engineer. So, Paul, can't thank you enough for coming out, man. Really, seriously, it was awesome. It's been Great a pleasure. Thank you. We'll be uh, sticking around here for a little bit, so I'm not sure if we'll get Paul here. So if you got any questions or want to come up and, and meet Paul, you can do that now. Thanks, guys. song, but that hill keeps going on and on. My heart is gone.
chains Can't seem to recall any given name I see the footprints How they come, how they go Was that only a moment or many years ago? My heart is gone 